So far in our study of the tribulation, we've seen its intensity, and we've seen its domination by Satan and his wicked human servants, and we have seen its destruction and its duration. And then last week, we stepped away from earth and took a look at what was going to be happening to us, those of us who are the body of Christ, uh, during that time when, when the tribulation is taking place here on earth. This morning, we're going to come back from heaven back to earth again during this tribulation time period. And we're going to shift our focus from the church age believers and previous to that to the general population during the tribulation to God's chosen people, the Jews, and what's going to be happening to them. Now, now you might be asking the question, what difference does this make to me? What difference does it make what happens to a bunch of Jews in the future? So they get stuck in the tribulation. So what? I'm not Jewish and I'm a saved person. I'm not going through the tribulation. Why should this concern me? Well, what happens to the Jews is important to us. Because, you see, if God does not follow through on his promises to the Jewish people, what chance is there that he's going to follow through on his promises to us? Plus, the Jews are God's chosen people. Amen. A people, Paul says, God is not yet finished with. Amen. With whom God is not yet finished. Get my English right here. Romans 11. Now that ought to interest us. Because of the nature of God, because of His promises, because these are God's chosen people, it should be of interest to us. Especially since so much of what we know about God, about trust, about salvation and prophecy and so on and so forth came to us through the Jews. So with all of that in mind, let's move back down from the glories of heaven where we were last week to the agony of the Jew on earth during the tribulation. First thing I want you to notice with me is the background of the tribulation. Jacob's trouble. Daniel's 70th week. Great tribulation and terror for God's people. Why? What is it that leads up to this event? And what sets the stage for Israel's agony? I want you to see five things with me related to the Jewish people that set the stage for the tribulation. To begin with, the promises of Scripture. And we could look at all of Matthew 24 and 25. As I mentioned, this is a passage where Jesus is speaking to his disciples, but he is still speaking in a Jewish context. From Daniel 9 and Daniel 12 to Joel chapter 2, to to Ezekiel 20, to Micah 5, to here in Matthew 24 and 25, we see predictions of a coming time of terror and sorrow for Israel. Yet all of this horror is set against the backdrop of the promise of deliverance that you see in Ezekiel 20 verses 33 to 44, and the promise of glory in Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. We won't take the time to look at those passages right now. In addition, God must yet fulfill His many promises to Israel. The promise of a land. Do you realize that the promise that God gave to Israel as far as the land that they would um, control has never yet been fully realized? It has not. Even in the glory days of David and Solomon, they did not extend all the way out to the Euphrates River. It has not yet been fully realized. So there is a promise that is yet to be fulfilled. 
There is a promise of an abundant seed and a universal and everlasting blessing. And all of those are the Abrahamic covenant. There is a promise of an everlasting king to sit on David's throne. And that is yet to be filled. That's the Davidic covenant. There is the promise of the specific land of Palestine, what we're talking about with respect to the land that they will uh, inherit. That's the Palestinian covenant. The promise of a restoration as a nation in the new covenant. So the character of God as truthful and trustworthy demands that he follow through on these promises. And he will. So the first, point, the first point to think about is the promises of God. And that sets up this period. And then there is the patience of God. Go to Romans chapter 10. A lot of people are scared off by Romans 9, 10, and 11. Because of the nature of the discussion about the character of God, the nature of the discussion about Israel, I've heard of lots of pastors who have preached Romans 1 through 8 and stopped. Or skipped to chapter 12. Skipped 8, 9, and, or 9, 10, and 11. Shame on them, but I've heard, I've heard of that happening. How would you respond to people who killed your son? Put this in your own personal situation now, those of you who have children. If it was in your power to do whatever you wish to that person, how would you respond? Would you wipe them out? I think most of us would. I think most of us would say, This is my chance to get even. This is my chance for justice for what you did to my son. Well, God was in just such a situation with all of us. But in particular with the Jewish people to whom Christ had come as Messiah and who they had rejected as their Messiah. And his response... Well, we see it here in chapter 10, verses 2, 3, and 4. Paul says, My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel, verse 1, is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. God's response has been patience. Long suffering, not willing that any should perish, Second Peter chapter three, verse nine, including Jesus' kindred according to the flesh, the Jews. Paul says that they were zealous, but not according to knowledge, ignorant of God's righteousness in Christ, working hard to bring about their own righteousness, and who would know that better than Paul? Yet God has been patient, and His patience will someday run its course, culminating in the tribulation. Stay in Romans and look at chapter 11 and verse 25. We see the problem that Israel has in verse 25. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own opinion, speaking to the Roman believers, You shouldn't be wise in your own opinion, thinking that you are somehow better than the Jewish people now. Blindness, in part, has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. It will take a knock on the collective Jewish head, the size of the tribulation, to capture their attention pull the scales off their eyes and help them to see what Jesus and who Jesus really is. There is a perception among them of the Messiah. And that perception excludes Jesus. I had a conversation before Christmas with a man with whom I play hockey and he's Jewish. And I was inviting these fellows to come to 
some of what's going on at our church. And he said, are Jews welcome? And I said, of course. I said, we worship a Jewish man. And he said, but I don't. Blindness has happened. Their perception of the Messiah is it cannot possibly have been Jesus. But there is coming a day when those scales will come off and they will see Jesus for who he is and they will weep because they have crucified the one who could be, could have been their Messiah and is in fact their Messiah. And he'll wipe those tears away at the end of the tribulation and they will say, you are in fact the Christ the Messiah but their perception of the Messiah now is false and then there's the perpetuity of the Jews hundreds of years before Christ prophets were predicting the tribulation period Christ himself 2,000 years ago predicted it was coming here in Matthew 24 such a prediction were it uttered with respect to oh let's say the Assyrians or the Amalekites would long ago be rejected on the basis of the fact that those nations no longer exist. No more nation, no more valid prophecy. Yet Israel, the Jewish people, often without a land, or a leader, or any earthly friends, has remained a nation. The eternal Jew, I have that in quotes because that is a phrase that has been used with respect to the Jewish people because even though they have been through so much, and we'll talk about that in just a second, even though they have been through so much, they continue to exist as a people. The eternal Jew is in place to fulfill prophecy. Is that a coincidence? I don't think so. It's an old book that I have here, and I want to read some things to you from it. It's uh, Lehman Strauss's book, God's Plan for the Future. And with respect to the persecution by the Gentiles, I just want to read you a list that he put in here. It wasn't compiled by him, but he put it in here. And uh, I'm going to condense it a little bit because it's kind of long, but I want you just to hear this. The Jewish persecutions. A.D. 50. 3,000 killed in Jerusalem as a result of conflict with the Romans. A.D. 66. Persecution under Florius, who was the governor of Judea. A.D. 7. A Roman army of 100,000 invades Israel. Marches on Jerusalem. And within one month, as a result of the awful siege, over a million people are killed. Mothers who had eaten their own children as a result of the siege died at the hands of the Romans along with their husbands. And the temple was burned. AD 135, Hadrian, who, by the way, persecuted the Christians to a great degree as well, devastated Palestine. Almost 600,000 more perished. A plowshare was run over Mount Zion so nobody would build anything on it again. And Micah chapter 3 verse 12 was literally fulfilled. A.D. 1020, Canute banished all Jews from England. A.D. 1096, a holy war began by attempting to massacre all the Jews in Europe. Henry II ordered the Jews to pay 60,000 pounds to defray his expenses during the Crusades because it was their fault. That was his approach. A.D. 1190, the tragedy of York Castle, in which the chief rabbi with 500 Jews were besieged. A.D. 1272, Edward I claimed to his own the Jew and all he possessed. He allowed him to amass riches and wealth, and the Jew that is, and then confiscated them all. 
drove out 16,000 from England. A.D. 1306, 100,000 Jews are stripped of all their wealth. A.D. 1348 to 50, the plague of the Black Death swept over Europe, and in Germany the Jews were charged with causing it by poisoning the wells. What ensued was bloodshed and carnage. The entire Jewish community in Strasbourg were killed. In Spain, the Inquisition started. Anybody ever heard of the Iron Maiden? The Iron Maiden was initially created to torture to death the Jewish people. 1492, all Jews were banished from Spain. Isn't that when somebody sailed the ocean blue? (laughs) Everything wasn't all good in 1492. 1753, their long night of torture and persecution began to end in this year when England passed the naturalization bill. But in 1933, a fellow came to power in Germany named Adolf Hitler and the development of a new and intensified wave of anti-Semitism Began And by the way, it didn't end in 1945. It continues to this day. Never in their history have they fu- suffered such horrible persecution, bloodshed, and carnage as during the years 1933 to 1945. And that's just a sampling. The Jews have been persecuted throughout the present age. And that persecution will hit its zenith during the times of the Gentiles in the tribulation period. While the persecutions listed in this book were terrible, in particular those 1933 to 45, they don't compare to the awful trials awaiting these dear ones during the time of Jacob's trouble. There's a lot of Jewish history behind what will take place during those seven years. Now, what factors will lead into tribulation? How will the Jews be prepared for this period? Both from a divine and from a human perspective. The blueprint, I think, has three pages. The first of those is their identity as a people. Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Even to that time, and at that time your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. Keep your finger there and go to Ezekiel chapter 37. We won't read this entire passage, but you'll get the point as soon as we start. Chapter 37, the hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of a valley and it was full of bones. Familiar with the song, Dem Bones, Dem Bones, Dem Dry Bones, here's the passage that it comes from. Caused me to pass by them all around. Behold, there were very many in the open valley and indeed they were very dry. Son of man, can these bones live? O Lord God, you know. Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. So I prophesied. Indeed, verse 8, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them. Well, verse 7, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling and the bones came together, bone to bone. Sinews and flesh came upon them, skin covered them over. Back in Daniel chapter... 12 and verse 11, it says that from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away, which means that there is a nation, there is an identity, there is a people connected to this. A people who are involved in their regular worship. A people who have come back together, who have been separated and dead as far as the world is concerned in many respects. Just 70 years ago, Israel was not to be found on any world map. She did not formally exist as a nation. But today the stage is set for the end times because Israel exists. 
Ezekiel saw Israel regathered in chapter 37, but at first the bones in the valley were regathered without life, according to verse 8. And that brings us to the second page of the blueprint. They will be identified as a people, but they will be ignorant of providence. They will be regathered, and they have been regathered in unbelief. Romans chapter 11. Come back to the book of Romans again. We're going to look at verses 7 and 8. Paul says, What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Just as it is written, God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear to this very day. They will reject the God who has chosen them, who loves them, who sent the promised Messiah to them, who is even now working to put them together as a nation. Israel today is a secular shadow of her former self. Now, let me say, she's militarily and economically a powerhouse, but Israel is a spiritual wasteland in many respects. She has not recognized the God who has pulled her back together as a nation. And as Paul noted, she is blinded to this day. Ezekiel foresaw the bones back together, covered with flesh, but there is no breath in them. So they have an identity as a people, but they are ignorant of providence, ignorant of God. And there will be an illusion of peace. I'm sorry for all the back and forth, but back to Daniel chapter 9. Actually, I'm not sorry. It's kind of fun to hear you turn in your pages of your Bibles. The third piece of the puzzle won't be in place until Antichrist is revealed and makes his treaty with Israel. The Jews during the first 40 years of Israel's modern existence were a fighting people. They had to fight to survive. Everyone knew not to mess with Israel or you'd get hurt. Just ask the Arab nations around her who attacked in 1948 and again in 1967. They got their collective noses bloodied as a result of that. And they learned to keep inside their own borders. They still attack. (laughs) But they do it in a clandestine fashion. They know not to come against her with an army. Their military reputation remains intact, but their desire for a negotiated peace grows stronger as time goes by. That is the Jewish people. Enter Antichrist. With a seven-year... Guarantee of peace and Israel's security. To a people who have been under the gun as long as the people of Israel have been, for a world leader to come in, create a treaty that guarantees them peace will be like manna from heaven. It'll be like... Are you kidding? This is, this is the best of all worlds. We'll take it. And that deception will be the final page in the blueprint for tribulation. The peace he will offer will be a mirage. Israel's immediate future will seem to be secure. But it will be filled with trial and hardship. And all of that will lead to the brutality of the tribulation. Come back to Matthew chapter 24 once again. Verse 15, Therefore when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet... That's the breaking of the treaty. And that abomination of desolation is standing in the holy place. Flee. 
Flee to the mountains. Get away. Pray to God that, it won't, that nothing will stand in your way or, or get in the, uh, in the path of your flight. <clears throat> For there will be great tribulation, verse 21, such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. Let me read that again. Such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. The worst the world will ever see. Bar none. Not the horrors of the Egyptian or the Assyrian or the Babylonian captivities. Not Rome's conquests and ultimate exile of the Jews. Not the genocide of Hitler's final solution. None of that even compares. Don't delay. Get to the mountains. Woe to those who are slowed down by carrying infants or nursing babies. Pray that it's not in winter. Pray that it's not on a Sabbath day. The the reason being that the Sabbath day is a day of limited travel for the Jewish people. Tribulation that is coming is so bad that except for God's mercy and shortening the days, every Jew would be killed. Verses 21 and 22. It will be the worst seven years in the history of the nation. In the history of a nation that has experienced the worst that mankind already has to offer. But, in the midst of the carnage, in the midst of the destruction and death, comes life. Romans chapter 11 again. And look at verse 26. A lot of people don't think of Romans 11 as prophetic. But it is. End of verse 25, blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and so all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Israel will be saved, not just politically, but spiritually, as their deliverer turns ungodliness away from Jacob. Daniel tells us in in, uh, chapter 12, verse 1, that we read earlier, at that time your people shall be delivered. And in verse 3, those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. And those who turn away many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Israel will finally realize in the hour of her worst trial that Jesus is truly Messiah. And she will turn to him and a remnant will be delivered. Now, the deliverance spoken of by Daniel and Paul is mentioned also by Jesus. It is salvation from the tribulation horrors into the millennial kingdom, and that is the balm for the tribulation. He who endures, Jesus said in Matthew 24, 13, to the end shall be saved. That's a reference to the Jew who survives the tribulation. They will be saved or delivered into the kingdom. And that is the gospel of the kingdom. You see Jesus say that? He says that's the good news of the kingdom. We don't preach the gospel of the kingdom right now. We preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, who died, was buried, and rose again to save you from your sins. The gospel during the tribulation will be the gospel that the Messiah is coming again to establish his kingdom, and you must believe in that Messiah. So at the end of the dark night of the tribulation is the shining day of the promised and long-awaited messianic kingdom. Israel's Messiah will return and deliver her from the trials of that time. It will be a wonderful day for Jew and Christian alike, but especially for the Jews who will see Christ pour the balm of his love into their tribulation wounds. And so all Israel will be saved. Romans eleven twenty six. Now let me let me say a couple things by way of application. The first is that what we have described for you here is a particular theological perspective on the end times. We are dispensationalists, not covenant theologians in large part because we believe that God will keep His promises. 
And we refuse to acknowledge the concept of covenant theology because covenant theology says God has abandoned Israel and we, the church, are now Israel. That is not God keeping his promises. That is God reneging on his promises. And that's why we don't accept that particular theological perspective. Now, why would I bring that up? There is a resurgence of reformed thinking among evangelical Christians today. Dispensationalism is often mocked by most in the evangelical community today. We are dispensational in large part because we believe in the character of God. The second thing I want you to notice is that a sad story will have a happy ending. But more than that, a long road finally leads right where God said it would lead. So there will be a kingdom. God keeps his promises. He keeps them to the Jews. And because we know that, he keeps them to us. Amen. And he has made promises to you, you know. Not every promise in the book is yours. We used to sing that little chorus. I remember singing it as a little kid. And then as time went by, I thought to myself, well, as people taught me, wait, that's not true. Every promise in the book isn't mine. My name isn't David. And I was not promised that my lineage would be sitting on the throne of of, of the kingdom of Israel forever and ever. That promise wasn't given to me. It's given to David and his descendants. And the promise also relates to the Jewish people, of which I'm also not one. So every promise isn't mine. However, God did make some promises to me. He promised that if I would trust Jesus as my Savior, that I would have eternal life. John 3.16 And just as he will keep his long-awaited promises to Israel, he will keep them for you as well. So put your faith in Christ. He will save you. That's a promise upon which you can depend. 